artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around. Hey, let's welcome Catalina Uyang. Welcome, Catalina. Um, I am so thrilled to have you here. It's so exciting. You have um, such a prolific array of works, um, very inspiring for our school. You just had a show open at No Place Gallery in Columbus, Ohio. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And um, like, you know, you mentioned what we're going to do here and how to prepare. And it's pretty chill. You get the chill vibe um yeah totally so we'll just you know i'll do a little interview things it'd be nice if you have a chance to sh i asked if you could show a few things just so people get a texture of what you do and everything that uh, like that you know i'll just as a way of introduction i saw so god i read i saw i did all this uh reading and watched a bunch of videos of you but i was thinking like um you said something that you're part of the chinese di diaspora that grew up in the like the hidden cul-de-sacs of Jersey, Chicago, or something like that, which sounded kind of cool and sweet and also very both American in its own diasporic kind of strange qualities. You also mentioned you're a child of the internet and that you work, you know, I know no one likes the idea of being an interdisciplinary artist and you're also, but you are an artist who finds freedom to work in a variety of materials and forms, including language, because uh, you're a writer yourself, in terms of producing works in the world. And certainly your exhibitions demonstrate a range of skill sets and different kind of forms of communication that produce a kind of tapestry of, uh, of, 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 of ideas that are interested in kind of queering or, or, or transmutating meaning or juxtaposing things between each other, sometimes biographic, sometimes semi-autobiographic and, and always political and social. So you got your MFA from Yale, very fancy, congratulations. I always say that about Yale, but it's cool. And, um, and certainly I think something that I clearly noticed right away is your uh, immense appetite for materials of various forms that really speak your works extraordinarily evocative. And so it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome to this experiment that you're in called the Alternative Art School. Uh, thank you, Nato, and um, thank you for all those um, kind and thoughtful insights about my work. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know uh, too much about um, your your school or, or the program, but um, it, it is immediately apparent that, you know, we have people from all over the world, which is cool, um, seemingly, you know, very, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I'm like waking up right now, but um yeah, you know, people. I'll tell you a little bit about it. I'll tell you a little bit about it real quick. We're a, we're a child of the pandemic, the school. Uh, we were only a year and a half old. We launched with the idea of having instructors with artists from around the world. And then the world spoke back what it wanted to be like. And look around. These are the artists that have come to us. And it's been incredible. And we've really built a community that's older in its demographic, though not necessarily has to be. Mm -hmm. leans female identifying though not everyone is here uh like that but certainly there's there's a constituency that is almost i would say not speaking everyone's behalf but school for everyone done with school uh in a way it's kind of school for people that want to live and be in community and actually have experienced the arts to some degree and i think the great kind of art experience is when you know that the art world has many different varieties and uh and there's a better way to be in it so maybe just as a question to you i said i'd start this way and i think it's always helpful how, you know since we are this school is a child of the pandemic perhaps maybe you can also just talk about how the last two years have been for you because it's kind of useful to just hear how ours are getting through these last few years um yeah well you know i i moved to new york uh just a few months before the uh, pandemic uh, or lockdown started. Um, so, you know, I finished grad school in um, summer of uh, 2019 and then was kind of moving around doing like shows and residencies. Finally landed in New York in um, November or yeah, late October 2019. And so I had about, you know, like four months before um, it, it all ended. 
uh so you know i like my my life was like in complete upheaval um leading up to lockdown and so in some ways it felt like uh not that nothing changed in my practice like you know i didn't go to my studio for almost half a year um but you know i um I had opened my first sort of big exhibition in New York a week before um, lockdown was called. And so I was planning to like take a, take a break anyway. Um, and uh, I was in this like crazy living situation in this like flooding basement and with these like violent, like racist roommates who I found on the internet. And I was like, all right, I can't uh, quarantine with these people. So um, I ended up like moving in with this person I'd met like a week before lockdown and then, you know, ended up living in that situation for a year. And, and so, you know, I felt like a trapeze artist, right. which is what I have felt like, you know, since finishing my undergrad, really um, just kind of going from one uh, thing to the next, hoping that it's like the floor is lava and you got to keep moving. Um, Great and, show, uh, by the way. I, you know, I have only watched part of um, one episode, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was expecting it to be something other than what it was. But um, yeah, so I mean, I think in some ways, uh, I mean, I don't know what my life would have ended up looking like if uh, there hadn't been a pandemic. Um, I think probably in some ways my adjustment to living in New York might have been harder, you know, with like faster pace and all this stuff. Um, as you mentioned, like I grew up in various like uh, suburban shitholes um, and then spent my- like, you too. I you did too. also, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I was I was in Missouri for six years, and so I I'm still kind of used to um, a more uh, laid back pace. Uh, I don't. I mean, I'm a Taurus also. I don't really like to do too many things, and so it was nice to. Um, I, I convinced the person who I moved in with uh, in the beginning of lockdown to uh, actually move apartments to be down the street from my studio. So then I was able to come back um, and, and work and uh, then just like out of nowhere, my my current gallery like called me and they were like, oh, we um, just read this interview that you did. Like, we love it. Um, I've never met you. I've never seen your work in person, but we want to give you a solo show, you know. And uh, so then I was just working toward that. And it's been kind of uh, nonstop since. Well, congratulations, A. On having a gallery call you that's never seen your work. I mean, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to recommend that to people, but certainly it's a gift. Um, you know, I, I just as a thought, just to kind of go back in your life a little bit. So I read that you were you have always been drawing, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious, just to, you know, not the long story, but just in terms of your evolution as an artist from drawing, which is classic ways to start in art to you know sculpture i saw i know you did a, you were I, I saw an interview where you said you really worked a lot in paper mache and like kind of in your undergrad your your where you went you kind of worked in sculpture and you studied sculpture both at yale and in your undergrad years but how your evolution of materiality grew and also your interest in writing because right now your project's so you know you're really versatile but that doesn't start there and i think it's useful for art and also if you don't mind if you have some pictures to show just to, so these folks can get a feel um is that yeah um you know i was planning to uh take photos in my i'll you know i'll actually like take my laptop and walk around in a second it's my favorite um, thing yeah i and hopefully my laptop doesn't just spontaneously uh turn off cool. because sometimes it uh does that <laughs> when i uh unplug it from the power but yeah, let me um, share my screen. Okay. Uh, so this is just on my uh, website. And um, 
Uh, let's see, this is the um, show that I have up uh, at No Place, uh, which um, consists or comprises uh, a couple sculptures, um, a uh, 40 minute film, um, like experimental film, and uh, a few drawings in a sort of conceptual painting. Um, so there's the one projection, um, which you sort of alternates between um, like found footage uh, montage and then um, uh, like a choreographed dance performance uh, that um, involves three dancers and like custom made garments uh, and um, and some vernacular videos, you know, from my, from my own family history and, and lived experience. Um, and these uh, sculptures, uh, you know, are sort of continuing a um, like material uh, vernacular that I've been sort of building and expanding on for the last several years, um, you know, that sort of combine uh, very laborious sorts of materials like uh, wood, carved wood or carved stone um, with um, the paper mache and plaster um, and different kinds of organic materials like um, uh, beeswax, horse hair, um, bones. You know, this is a mustang pelvis. Um, this is, uh, I, I used to use um, some fabric in my work and I haven't in a while, but, you know, I was thinking a lot about um, like the Baroque and um, fabric and the fold, um, uh, like fr Phrygian wet drapery as it sort of appears throughout our history as this kind of um, way of thinking about like space time matter um, or as a way of like extending a surface area through like what is like hidden or like what gets like pressed against um, or um, the ways that boundaries sort of get uh, collapsed or pressed against each other. Um, and I go, you know, fabric is like one way to think about that. Um, so, you know, a lot of, um, the sculptural work is figurative um, or, you know, exists in some spectrum of like abstracted figuration or um, I like to say like devastated figuration. Um, you know, it kind of just, I mean, I, I'd love to know your, um, what inspired you, but certainly, I mean, I just have to say right off the bat, the works are so evocative and they're really, they really hit you hard and fast. And I think, you know, your experiments with fabric are very, uh, are very successful, you know, and those, co the color juxtapositions do evoke the Baroque. And, you know, I do, you know, it's interesting because I, I, it's, um, I love figurative and I was thinking too, it reminds me, I mean, I hate to be so corny, but I got three artists in mind, which is Kiki Smith, Robert Gober, Matthew Barney, like all three. And I guess it's because they always played with the body a lot and, 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 and materiality and also had a certain kind of haunted devastated quality to them for sure i mean uh kiki smith robert gober um absolutely i have complicated feelings about matthew barney um i mean well, when you say beeswax i can't help but go barney in my head mm, you know i am i am most familiar with his overwrought um film and video works and then all the silicone stuff uh you know which we all know has been very popular uh in a contemporary art practice uh for the last decade yeah. um but i mean you know louise bourgeois huge sure. huge uh like i you know it's it's obvious um yeah and i mean i think about or even someone like um, Berlin's to break hair, um, if you're familiar sure. with her work. Um, yeah, all this sort of um, abject figuration, um, I've seen it called. Uh, I also have a sort of complicated relationship to, um, you know, terms like the abject or grotesque because there is sort of this inherent value judgment in those terms. And totally. I think it says more about the, the describer than the thing that is described, you know, and what the describer is afraid of in terms of their own mortality. Uh -huh. um, and I mean, I think also, you know, something um, in the work is uh, invested in, uh, you know, this like closeness to 
death or this closeness to annihilation. Um, I think like a lot of the work stems from, uh, you know, the writing, my writing also stems from like traumatic experiences or, you know, experiences with self-destruction and addiction and all this, you know, other stuff, um, you know, uh, self-destructive uh, patterns of behavior. Um, and, uh, you know, part of why I like working with uh, these like laborious processes is that it's um, that labor is somewhere to put it, um, you know, like this, this heaviness of feeling. Um, but yeah, I mean, to, to go back to, uh, you know, your question about my, my sort of uh, material evolution, um, I started drawing as a young child. Uh, you know, I think growing up in middle of nowhere, uh, you know, part of my childhood was in Illinois. I was, you know, my brother and I were the only Asian people in our school district. Um, you know, we were on a cul-de-sac, but it was the kind of cul-de-sac where, you know, our neighbors were always like smoking cigarettes in their bathrobes on their driveways, like screaming at their spouses. Um, and so I just, I had very little interest in the people around me. Um, I had very little interest in, um, you know, school-based learning because um, I was a little shithead and I always felt smarter than my teachers, which, you know, I might have been. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I spent my whole childhood in, in public school. And um, so, so, you know, I was drawing and even then I had this distinct sense that my life had to be bigger than, than this. And, and probably like art making would be my ticket out. And um, that has pretty much persisted through um, my entire life. And has, <clears throat> so- uh, Is there, is there I, a question, just a question on that? Like, cause yeah. it's, it seems so familiar to me because I grew up in such a crappy school and, um, and it really motivated me. <laughs> in a negative way but I must say at what point I'm just kind of curious as an evolution as an artist because it's hard to know you're going to be an artist it seems almost impossible you know especially like as a something you could call yourself you know like did that what did was that always something you had in mind or was that something that evolved and then when did you feel you gained some confidence in it were you always like I'm a badass or at some point were you like no maybe this could work um so I think it was when I began living on the internet um, when I was nine. And I, uh, you know, we had this computer in our basement and that was like the, the shared desktop. And I would just spent all my time uh, on these video gaming forums. I, I actually never played video games, but I would watch my brother, my older brother play video games. Um, you know, RPGs like Final Fantasy, there was this one game a pretty mediocre video game called Dynasty Warriors that was set in um, like the Three Kingdoms period of China. Um, that was like around 200 AD. And that got me really interested in that specific um, historical um, period in Chinese history. I, I drew all of the, I think it was like 200 characters, like portraits of them. Um, I actually spent all my time uh, researching like biographies of each uh, like historic warrior and then like typing them up, printing them out, illustrating them by hand and then binding them by hand uh, like a fucking weirdo. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so so I, I was on several different forums for this Dynasty Warriors game and then, you know, like Final Fantasy forums. And um, actually, you know, my, my earliest sort of uh, supporters or the, the people who really encouraged me in my art making, you know, it wasn't coming from my school. It wasn't coming from my parents. I was raised by a single mom who was never around. Um, it was these like basement dwelling uh, 28 year olds who were like, I mean, I told them that I was 12 because it sounded better than nine. Um, and, uh, you know, they would just be uh, commenting, like, you know, saying like, you gotta keep writing, you gotta keep drawing. Like, these are amazing. Um, you know, I had like a fucking multiple, like hundreds of pages of this thread of my artwork. And, you know, if, if I didn't post for like a week, people would be like, you know, checking and being like, where, like, what's up? Like, where, where's your new work? Um, and so, 
yeah, you know, it's like, it, it was these um, weird incels uh, in the early 2000s who really were like my, my first um, cheerleaders and, and teachers in a way. Um, and, um, you know, I actually remember very distinctly the one drawing where I sort of, in my own eyes, uh, made the leap from being uh, of middling talent, of, of mediocre, you know, skill, to suddenly being good. It was this um, this uh, copy of a of a fashion ad that Angelina Jolie was in for St. John's, and um, I I was drawing it, and when I finished it, I was like, damn, like this looks like a freaking photo, and you know, I think I was in like seventh grade at the time, and. Um, that's when I um, like kind of blew up on DeviantArt, which was this like online um, I that. Art, like, fan art community uh, that I think it's still around. But um, yeah, so then DeviantArt became this kind of real like motivating uh, platform for me to keep drawing and really kind of push my, um, you know, uh, my skills in rendering. Um, and essentially, I mean, the thing about drawing is that I always kind of hated doing it. Um, I liked sharing the product because it felt cool to, you know, be like a Xerox machine. Um, but I didn't enjoy doing it. And, you know, I was also a pretty um, avid reader and I, I wrote a lot as a kid. Um, I was, you know, pretty uh, motivated, like straight A student and something about uh, giving it all away for drawing, I always felt like a potential, like, I don't know, a waste of my brain. And so um, I ended up going to St. Louis for school because I got a full ride. And even at the time I was like, all right, I have, uh, the rest of my life to get an MFA somewhere that actually matters. So I'm just gonna like do undergrad, my BFA debt free. Um, and uh, so, so there at Washington University in St. Louis, their um, art program is very much sort of tied to, you have to take academic classes in other departments. You gotta take math and science shit and like writing and um, literature classes. Um, and a lot of the, the professors who teach there were like, you know, um, le leaders in their field or, or whatever. So it was pretty um, like intellectually uh, stimulating. And, and that was really the first time that I was around like truly rich people or like people who were, had been born into like real blue blood money, like people whose parents were collectors, who people whose parents were artists. Like I didn't even know that private schools were really a thing until oh I got it. It's so funny. You were totally repeating my life story because <laughs> yeah. I was like uh, this, like people, kids would be like, oh, we read Marx in ninth grade. I'm like, what kind of school did you go to? And then I realized life was totally unfair. And I thought I was the smartest kid ever. And I realized I was like the dumbest kid ever. And I was like, because I was so feeling embarrassed how smart I thought I was. And I was so behind, it, you yeah. know? And I felt really like kind of ripped off. Like where, I was like- Where did you grow up? Well, I grew, I mean, I moved all over the place, but I was in the place called, my dad went to Cal Arts. We lived in this poor neighborhood called New Hall, California. And so I went to public schools and then I, what, it does a long, it's not about me, but just to say, just to say, it's almost like you yeah. get out of high school and you know, high school's crap, but you think you're not the crap. And then you go to college and then you find out you're crap. And then you're like, you're like, what? I'm not crap. I'm like a badass, but why did I not get in? Why did I have all these disadvantages that I didn't even know about? It's unfair. Anyways, whatever. Um, but I want to yeah. ask you something. What? Oh, sorry. Go on. But, but I wanted to, because we're going to, we don't, these things are fast and we're going to get to, I always oh, like to get our artists to, to ask you a lot of things, but you know, there's two things I want to fast forward to, if you don't mind. Um, and by the way, you're super interesting. It's like awesome to hear everything you say. It's like this. Um, I want to know too, A, your work looks, you said labor, your work looks like a lot of work, right? Which I like, like I call it that, like, you know, you can feel the aesthetics of like hard work. You know, they don't look easy to make, but also you're um, I'm curious about when you felt confident in this 
when did you just to kind of move forward when did you feel confident about mixing sculpture with all these different forms writing video like the, the ability to move fluidly between these because i think it's really important also kind of terrifying as an artist mm -hmm. well yeah i mean uh my sort of point about being at this fancy you know university was that um you know, I didn't know any, like when I started um, undergrad, my favorite artist was maybe Gustav Klimt. Like I didn't know what misogyny was. I didn't know what conceptual practice was. Um, and these were all things that I learned in one particular course uh, when I was a sophomore. Yeah. Uh, you know, I spent my first year making oil paintings, uh, which I was good at and it was very boring. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I took this class that was actually a, a grad school level class um, on, on a time based media. And that was pretty much like oh, diving right in. It's like Eduardo Katz, it's like Orlan, it's like uh, uh, freaking Pierre Hui and all the uh, relational aesthetics people. And I was like, I'm way like out of my depth, but like this is the first time in many years that I'm feeling like really excited yeah. about, you know, the, the, horizons of you know what what art can do and like what what it can be and um so i made um and and i was starting to write again also because um my undergrad university has one of it has a very good um writing like poetry and fiction mfa and the um you know writing classes would be taught by those mfa students um and i think i actually learned more about art making from those writing courses than i did in the art program, which was not so rigorous. Um, I, you know, I did a lot of- Why, why? Teaching. What, what why about writing? Why, no, why did writing, what did you, what, what about the writing courses really um, got you going? I mean, just the sort of craft essays that we were reading and, and the ways that we would break down, you know, how, how a writer was structuring either a poem or, or an essay or a story, um, all of that, was uh, translatable to you know visual practice and the ways that um like workshops uh where you would like give feedback on on writing pieces were set up i found a lot more um productive and generative than the chaotic like critiques that we were having um in studio um i mean one question from many writing workshops that sticks with me to this day in my own practice is, um, you know, what's at stake in this piece? Right. Um, and I think that is a much better question than what is this piece trying to do? Or like, what is it trying to communicate? Or like, what do you want the viewer to feel? Or, you know, because you're never trying to preempt some kind of reaction from the viewer or the reader, right? It's like really like, yeah, but there's no better way to put it than what's at stake. So um so i was writing a lot and um and then i just started you know making a lot of pretty bad um like video and installation work and um i think that also felt rewarding um like making stuff that was really bad i had never really given myself permission to do that in my entire life because you know i had to be excellent to escape like where i was coming from um and finally you know i had landed in um you know this haven of like the 0.1 percent and i was like well i mean i'm surrounded by rich fuck ups so now i'm gonna be you know be able to like fuck around um and uh yeah i mean the the rest of the sort of interdisciplinary aspect um of my practice just grew pretty organically from that here, let's just stop screen share because I want to get to the oh, studio. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I got to say, it's so compelling. I really could listen to you for hours and maybe we could bring you back to hear more because it's just so awesome. I really appreciate your, your just your sincere and open approach to what this is. Um, I wanted to have the artists in attendance. Um, I love our, I love this school so much. Everybody's so awesome. Um, we have an incredible artist on our hands. I, there was just a brief glimpse at some of the work, I, you know, We'll send links around so people can learn more. But if you guys have questions for Catalina, um, that would yeah, be- Yeah, and I'm gonna walk around um, while y'all are thinking about questions just to show you a little bit of my studio. I'm working on these wood carvings right oh, that's now. that's cool. And um, 
these figures are all based on Beltu's paintings, the ones that he made of the um, 11 year old girl. Um, and uh, I don't know if you remember when Beltu's had a big like retrospective at the Met Breuer um, and it was his paintings of, you know, Therese, uh, his, his young muse and um, it was uh, widely protested. Um, you know, for him being like a, I don't know, pedophile or a pederast or something, mm -hmm. um, or like abusing young girls. So these are all like three dimensional sort of renderings, like um, translating like the flat image of these like sexualized girls into, um, you know, like objects in the round and sort of exposing the um, like titillating parts of their body that Baltus sort of uh, both like masks in his painting, but also, you know, like fetishizes. Um, and I'm just like thinking about um, like the muse and the gays and like exploitation and also like trying to not restore some kind of agency, but um, I don't know, like explode, explode the, those questions. Do you um, do all that yourself, that work, by the way? Yes. That's intense. Yeah, I mean, I work uh, basically like 16 hour days every day, <laughs> um, which, I, you know, it's like, it, it's it's a lot. It's, it's, um, it's uh, what's the word? Um, like it's ruthless work, but obviously I get to do this full time and that's a huge blessing. Well, congratulations on that. And, you know, in terms of the, um, let me ask you something about the Baltus work you're working on too, just in so much as it, I always feel like it's it's tricky to, to uh, interrogate art history in a way, like um, because it can get it can it can easily become a kind of um, well, let me be candid, which is I think that a the re art history is so the male gaze that it's totally worth exploring that constantly because the entire collection mostly museums that's what it all is. <laughs> And like, you know, between colonialism and patriarchy, you've got most of the collection. So, you know, that's there. But I've also, at the, the times I, I wonder, like, um, it can be somewhat of a, people love art about art. And I always think like it's a delicate line to both reinforce those narratives as well as critique them. So, you know, how do you, you know what I mean? Like it's sometimes like you, by critiquing it, you still also bolster it in a way. Oh, so, for sure. you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, I fucking love Baltu's paintings. I think he's one of the best. I think he was definitely a fucked up guy. Um, but, you know, the, the presence of the monster and this sort of, um, this act of like calling yourself forth to, to love the monster and really try to figure out like what you take and what you leave because it's like you know the monster might be my mother the monster might be all my idols the monster is Louise Bourgeois the monster is everybody I have ever aspired to be like learn from um be a lover to you know etc like the whole string of abusive relationships I've ever been in um it's all about like sitting with that kind of complication so you know I like my engagement with Baltus is not me being like, hashtag me too, like look at this fucked up guy. It's me being like, I love these paintings and why. Yo, that's totally intense and dope. Um, totally with that. I'm totally with what you said, love the monster. I, you know, that's kind of reminds me of like when I worked with Carol Walker and she would say, I always produce work that freaks me out. Yeah. Like she'd be like, she looks at it and goes, what's wrong with me? <laughs> right. And, and I think like there's something about I like the phrase love the monster in a way, because I think there's a lot of complexity around power and desire and history and aesthetics all kind of wrapped in with that. So I appreciate that. OK, you guys have had some time to think um, someone can come forth with Catalina Uyang. Oh, young, by the way. Oh, yeah. Young. My apologies. Yeah. I've actually done that before. Yeah. the name thing. Amber, you got something. I know you do. I'm a bit curious about your um, just trajectory into how did you find working um, full time as an artist, you know, like leaving grad school can be quite 
um, tumultuous. And I'm curious what kind of uh, pathway did that, yeah, what, what did that involve? What did you go and do? Who did you meet? And how did this, you know, materialize uh, for you? I basically, uh, to the sacrifice and detriment of literally everything else in my life, just would find ways to put my art practice first. You know, um, I, I gave up on relationships. I gave up on friendships. You know, I, I didn't see my fan. Like, um, I, was, I was reading about the life of William S. Burroughs actually the other night. And I mean, you know, he was a total nightmare had kids, didn't raise them, like just fucked off and like did drugs and, and wrote his his weird little books. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm on that level, but yeah, you know, it's like th there's not really room for much else. And, um, you know, I, I've been funding uh, pretty much with very little external support, uh, these like pretty expensive installations, like ever since I was an undergrad and, it's literally like, okay, how am I going to like hustle this money together? Like, I'm not going to work honestly for it. I mean, you know, I, I've been escorting since I was 22. So um, I think uh, I call it the, um, that's my own like private foundation. Um, and uh, it's just a way to keep making the work that I want. You know, like you got to just do whatever it takes. Um, it's the one thing I care about. That's so, you're so intense. That's awesome. You know, um, <laughs> well, listen, I want, let me ask you about that and just follow up on that, if you don't mind, which is, we, we were just talking about that in my class, which is, um, we're doing a class called How to Make a Life of Art. And sometimes really great artists destroy human relationships on them, around them. And maybe just to ask you about that, because of course, you know, as a life practice, sometimes I find you know, you're also, I wonder, how do you, how much do you think about if that's the way you'll always be in terms of your art first, or if that's something that's going to get you to a certain phase at which you're able to kind of have a different sort of life? You know what I mean? Like, is that something that's always going to be your modality, or is that something you plan on changing as the circumstances change? I think other people have other desires you know they want to have a family they want to you know retire retire one day I don't really know what that means um but um I mean yeah it's not that I'm not interested in other people I love being around other people but I love my first marriage to my work even more and I think if I wasn't like doing this constantly with this level of intensity um and chaos too like the, the chaos of it is um keeps me from being uh bored and like self-imploding because mm -hmm. um I'm, I'm like a pretty uh like controlled and like level-headed psychotic person but i think that's because since i was a kid i've had this place to to put it you know that's awesome hey um any oh let me go to the gallery view anybody else some some questions thoughts yes. I have Paulina. Hi, Catalina and Paulina from Guatemala. And you said you spend around 16 hours at your studio. And for me, it's always, it's always um, awe to see how much of the body and time every artist puts in a piece. So I want to know how those 16 hours are for you and what makes you stop? Is it just the tiredness of your body or is it because the piece says in that moment, that's it, that's where I have to leave it. Is it your oh, body yeah. or, or is it? Um, yeah, the, the piece owes once more. Um, it's, it's literally like, oh, it's 5 a.m. and I need to, you know, have like a, a threesome at 9 a.m. to pay my rent um and so I'd better like go to sleep um yeah it, it's it's your I, I feel like I'm always just racing against the day um and in terms of I you know my first few hours in studio um I've sort of now realized like I have to give myself permission to just like fuck off 
you know, watch television, eat food, make coffee, like whatever, answer emails. And so um, it's about maybe like three or four hours in that I like really get to work. And then that's just like a nonstop, like 10 or 12 hours. I'm just on my feet, uh, either carving or- It's that you have when you start work after this three or four hours of just you know, settling around and then just the urge comes and you start working until you say stop? I wouldn't say the urge comes. It's more like I am like, it's time to whip my ass into shape. Like, you know, like sometimes I really have to like castigate myself into like peeling myself up because I, there's, there, there are days that I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm like, I don't want to fucking do this. But, you know, it's like, I don't have a boss. Like nobody's going to, punish me if I don't work like I I'm just punishing myself right like um yeah so like I I know that like me being able to do this is like it's I mean it's so rare it's such a like privilege like and I'd better like you know make it on that um but once once I start working it's like I I lose sense of um, my corporeal needs. Like I don't get yeah. tired. I don't get thirsty. I don't get sleepy, you know? Um, but I, I would say like my, my work, like my sense of inertia in working is very strong and also in my life, yeah. like, you know, it's almost impossible to like get me going. And then it's almost impossible to stop. Uh, yeah. I wanted to just go to Hawa next too. Thanks, Paulina. Hi, Catalina. It's so great to hear about your work and just to feel your energy. Um, And something that stood out about what I read on our platform was the perpetual struggle of non-mastery. And I would love to hear more about that myself. I, this is my first like foray into art school. I'm not formally trained in anything and my family didn't support an artistic path. And so, um, I have found safety in non-mastery and not knowing what my tools are, how to use them or, or anything like that. And a lot of my photography is iPhone photography, but I think it's like really rad. Um, and so I'm really curious about that struggle with, you know, the confidence that's there, but also the times where it might feel a little destabilizing if, if it does at all. Um. One phrase, maybe the only thing I took away from grad school that was productive, um, is uh, from Fred Moten. And, uh, you know, he said, it's a toy box, not a toolbox. And um, I mean, I think like my relationship to uh, academic reading, um, theory, philosophy and stuff, it's like, I don't have any um, foundation in engaging with that stuff. it makes me feel stupid, but um, one like productive way of like framing it for myself has been like um, like generative misreading. You know, like how can you just like give yourself permission to misread the thing? You know, yeah, like if a real uh, philosopher heard or saw the way that I'm using this theory or activating it, like they'd have a fucking heart attack. You know, but who cares? You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm here to play. And I feel that way about um, materials also. Like I basically didn't learn how to do anything in undergrad because I like didn't really go to class. And when I went to class, I like didn't listen to the assignments because, you know, I was there to fucking make art, not listen to people. And so like, I don't know how to use a table saw. Like, I don't know the proper way of, of fucking doing anything. Um, but it's like, I have the vision and then beyond that, it doesn't really matter. Like through like sheer force of will and then just like cobbling shit together in my like chaotic intuitive way, like it will get there. Um, you just have to like, I don't know, want it enough. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. I didn't know that phrase, uh, toy box, toolbox, the Fred Moten thing. That's pretty cool. Get, especially with theory, man, you need some license to ill. What are you gonna do? Like just to take it in face, you're just like, I don't know. I always joke with like a thousand plateaus with Deleuze and Guattari. I'd always like me and my buddy Trevor would like go to professor's desk and be like, I dare you to explain that book to me. I dare you. And they'd be like, Well, relax. I don't actually know. I just put it by my desk. Um 
Um, anyone else got some? Uh, uh, you're just such a breath of fresh air, Catalina. Um, anybody else? Um, questions, thoughts? Come on. I will say the thing I like about um, De, well Deleuze and Guattari, but also Deleuze's own writing is that um, I think he's a very playful writer, and I think half the shit he writes, he doesn't even know like what's really going on with it, and um, he's just kind of like you know playing with terminology um, at like the level of the sentence, and um, like I, I was really revisiting his essay, The Fold. Uh, which is like about, you know, quantum physics and Leibniz and whatever. And he doesn't really know what he's talking about, but that's the point, you know, like it's about this kind of um, almost like virtuosic, um, well, it, it's, uh, he, he's having fun and it's like he's having a drunken conversation with a friend and, and nobody really knows what's going on. Like, I think that is really beautiful. Well, he's I well, I'll let Maria go, but I would just well, the caveat on that is I'll say it's led to a certain curatorial language that I just put in category of poetics. I don't know what you know, I'm like, I'm not sure what you think your thesis is, but I appreciate your poetics. Um, but Maria, go ahead. Hi, Catalina. It's so nice to have this introduction to your amazing work. I'm so fascinated by it. I have a sort of a combined question. One is I'm really interested in the work you're doing about Balthus and all those parts of bodies you have, those evocative Balthusian bodies. Um, I'm wondering where you're going with that. Are you doing an installation? Is it going to be multimedia with video? I'm, I'm curious about next steps. And then the other part, I'm very curious about how your projects develop and maybe you talk a little bit about process. Thanks. Um, well, in, yeah, in terms of how, you know, each body of work gets born at this point, um, it really is uh, a, a uh, what's the word? a slippery continuum, you know, it's like, I used to feel like I had to, you know, reinvent the wheel every time I started something new, because I didn't have like a history of like interdisciplinary work that I could just build on. And now, you know, um, sorry, I'm just going to share my screen just to pull up um, this uh, uh, ongoing series, uh, just to answer your question about the um, Balthus pieces. Uh, so those bodies are going to become uh, further additions to this reliquary series that I've been uh, making. And they're modeled, these are modeled after, you know, like Catholic reliquaries um, that have this sort of uh, like opening door that has like a chamber in the body that's supposed to, you know, hold the, the bone or, um, you know, body part of a saint. Uh, so yeah, this is like another one. Um, um, you know, so this is one, and this is sort of also referencing like the, the corpus of uh, Christ, you know, hanging in the altar. Um, these sorts of uh, like material cultures of faith are, are quite interesting to me um, because they're very erratic, you know, they're, they're, they're really, um, I mean, fetish objects are sort of attributed with some kind of um, power that is hard to, you know, understand or grasp. And I think that is how I feel about like making art at large. Um, and so each of these Balthusian girl bodies is going to have some kind of chamber opening in it. Um, and you know, I like these little chambers because they're also spaces for me to create kind of more um, like gestural and abstracted um, pieces. So if you'll just bear with me, I have one. Oh yeah, so this uh, reliquary, you know, um, has one of these sort of like swirly sepulchre forms in it. Um, and so it's just like, almost like um, it creates this opportunity to have a different artwork within the artwork, right? Um, and uh, so those Beltu's reliquaries will you know, be mounted on the wall. These are all going to um, a, a booth at Art Basel. 
which is not, you know, the most uh, thrilling way for, you know, for me, um, for a body of work to live and die, but it is what it is. And um, those pieces will be in conversation with um, work that deals with the legacy of Edmonia Lewis, who was the um, first Black American woman sculptor to achieve recognition in a Western context. And so she was very active um, around like Civil War time. And she was very popular among these uh, well-intentioned abolitionists who really kind of just like fetishized her and exploited her. Um, and uh, so I am like recreating um, one of her sculptures where she basically cashed in on um, this, uh, you know, beloved union officer who had been killed. And she made all these plaster busts of him, Robert Goldshaw, and she used the sales of those busts to finance her move to Italy. Cause she was like, I'm fucking done with this place. Like I'm out, like I'm going to Rome. Um, and so what I was like saying before about, you know, how I'm thinking about like the muse in the Balthusian context, I'm also thinking about you know, this, this other take on like the subject or, or the muse, um, you know, with Edmonia Lewis and her sort of deployment of this um, like white abolitionist martyr um, and the different ways that like this sort of power deferential um, gets metabolized or activated, um, you know, between like the, the maker and, um, and their subject. That's incredible. Hey, you guys. I'm sorry, Catalina. We always have a hard stop at the top of the hour. Apologize because we can go on forever. But I remember when I worked at Mass Mocha, the director said to me, leave them wanting more. And I think our, our artists here do want more. Thank you so much for your incredibly um, generous time and your hard work. Everyone, let's give a round of applause to Catalina. Thank you. Absolutely incredible. It's been a um, pleasure. It's been so great to have you. We have a tea time, everybody, at noon. Is this correct? Or EST? Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world.